Welcome to Conversations with Karalia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Karalia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Welcome back, everyone, to what is going to be season three of Conversations with Karalia. Yes, my name is Karalia, and there's been a few changes since I was last with you. I have moved back to Canada. Uh, my mum is from Canada, so I'm a dual citizen, and I'm back living in the Cedar Sky Corridor in Squamish. I'm aware I'm not pronouncing that word correctly in the indigenous way. Um, these lands are the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. And I'm so in love with this land. Like, I love this land. The mountains and the trees and the rivers and the rocks. It just, oh my God, the land is so alive and so vibrant. It just speaks to me. Um, and I still feel really connected to my community back in Aotearoa, back in New Zealand, the Conscious Festival community. And so as I launch this next series or season of Conversations with Karalia, I'm kind of making this one for you, you know, like this one's for you. Um, it's been a bit of a wild ride since I've come back to Canada. I've been digesting quite a lot of karmic impressions. Not going to go into that. This is not about me. This is about, well, this is about my guests and the topics that we are going to dive into. So I have the great honor today of welcoming to the show Warren Hooley. So Warren, I met at the Heart of Tantra Festival, which happens here every year in BC, just up the road from where I live. Um, I stumbled into, literally kind of stumbled into his community, his, his workshop on communication and I picked up some things. I learned some things. And as I consider myself a communications professional, I was like, well, that's refreshing. Um, and in particular, I really loved the way that he presented a nervous system model that, you know, we're all familiar with fight, flight, freeze, and now of course, fawn. He brings in another aspect. And when he started speaking to this, I'm not even going to give the show away right now. But when he started speaking to this, I was like, oh my goodness, this confirms like my hunch or my intuition that I have had over the last few years in my community back in New Zealand. I've had a sense that we've, we've had some stuff come up in terms of leadership and the way that leadership is being held. And, you know, we, we're trying to call people in. We're trying to hold people to account. And I've noticed that some of the leaders, some of the people that we're attempting to hold to account, I feel as if they're going into a nervous system response. I feel as if they're going into a fear response. And when Warren laid out his particular model of the nervous system, I was like, oh, that's the missing piece. So of course, I had to invite Warren to come on the show. We're going to talk about a whole lot of things. Um, the topics that I want to cover with him range from everything to that nervous system model, to community, to the path of healthy masculinity, to how he as a facilitator keeps himself safe and keeps participants safe, how he works with other facilitators to support them, to work with the dynamics that can come up um, as a facilitator working with participants. We're going to talk about the difference between cancel culture and holding people to account or calling people in. And we're going to talk about decolonization. Um, it's really interesting for me to be on these lands, having, you know, grown up in Aotearoa and feeling such an affinity and a love for Te Ao Māori, the Māori worldview, the world of Māori. And, you know, we, we it's, shit went down in New Zealand, like shit went down in New Zealand, for sure. And there is a decolonization process that is happening and needs to happen over there. And there's, there's some ways that we're so fortunate in New Zealand as well. We have the richness of te reo. 
which has had an extraordinary resurgence. Um, and one of the things I noticed about coming back to Canada is that the signs are actually now bilingual. Uh, when you drive up the Cedar Sky Corridor, the words are both in English and the local indigenous tribal language as well. Um, and so we're going to talk about all of these different things and just kind of compare notes. So I think Warren's the first Canadian that I have had on the show. He definitely will not be the last because obviously I'm in Canada now. Alrighty, as always, please do stay until after our conversation because I always do a bit of a debrief and reflections and a wrap up of our conversation and that can get really juicy. So let's bring Warren on huh, and see what he has to say. Mm. Warren, welcome to Conversations with Karalia. <laughs> it's nice to be here. Yeah. Where in the world are you right now? Calling in from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Awesome. Thanks for like, you, you are the first guest on the first episode of season three, kicking off in Canada now that I've moved to Canada. So super stoked to have you here. And recognizing that a lot of my audience is from New Zealand, Aotearoa, and they'll have no idea who you are. Um, can you give us some orientation to, yeah, who you are, what you bring to the world, what you're connected to? Um, love to know. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Mm. Yeah. So my full name is Warren Sean Hooley. Um, my father's mainly English and Ukrainian. And on my mother's side, I'm mostly Okanagan Sikh indigenous my traditional name is so translates to mountain goat <laughs> so i see that as like a metaphor overcoming things that may seem impossible sometimes <laughs> like the tech challenges we just had coming yes <laughs> maybe just for a sake of disclosure i can hear my own voice repeated back so it's like talking over someone's whole time but we'll work yeah. with it yeah. Um, in a nutshell, I am really passionate about communication. Mm -hmm. And I think communication in all its forms for the sake of, can we build communities that are genuinely healthy, sustainable, and still allows us to follow our dreams and thrive. And I would say growing up myself, that was not something I was taught. You know, I kind of grew up with a teenage friend group. We were kind of harsh on each other. We had fun times. We teased each other, but we also bullied each other a lot. And through that process, I kind of learned to dissociate, disconnect from my body. I lost a lot of capacity to be empathetic and in my true like inner child. And it became really hypercritical, really cemented in certain Western ideas of like climbing the ladder, competition, individualism, very mind dominant. Mm -hmm. And I think the hardest part about it is I was quite arrogant about it. Like I really thought when I was 17 that I had it all figured it out. And I look back and I was actually the most lost I ever was. Mm. So when I came into my 20s, it was obviously impacting my relationships in a big way, not being able to hold emotional space, not really being able to understand where someone else is coming from, just kind of always in debate mode, always trying to have a logical, rational, serious conversation. And of course there's place for that. There could be healthy debate and it's can be really rewarding to the world we live in. And yet there's another side to the coin, which is actually listening to understand mm. and having that in balance in your life. And so as I started to get into a couple of different bodies of work, mainly teaching healthy masculinity to young teenage boys and also teaching indigenous allyship, teaching people how to be better allies towards indigenous people, 
here in North America. I started to stumble across people having resistances, if you will. And I started to learn from one of my mentors. Her name is Sarah Payton. I started to learn how the nervous system works, relational neurobiology. And it was through that and the combination of nonviolent communication that I started to ask myself this question, what actually works? What actually works? And mainly how that relates to what are my ultimate goals? What am I really trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. So with the clarity of those goals, like for example, with the teenage boys, I started to notice, you know, my intention was a bit off, especially early on. I kind of had this intention of, I'm trying to stop these young men from becoming future perpetrators, say sexual violence, for example, or I'm trying to stop these white people from doing racist things. And I found when I came at it from that angle, I had a lot more judgment. I, a certain energy came from me mm -hmm. and it tended to create more resistance in the people that I worked with. There's nothing more demoralizing than getting an argument with like a 14 year old boy about right alt politics or something like that. <laughs> I come out of these workshops. And, and also like if my family, I'd try to talk to them about indigenous people, like maybe breaking yeah. a stereotype, for example. And I come out of these conversations and it just didn't feel good. Mm. Like it didn't feel like we really made any ground. It felt like the walls between us actually got bigger. Mm -hmm. and so I started asking this question. Okay, well, what actually works? There's gotta be, there's gotta be better ways. And I literally followed that path for the past 13 years. Mm -hmm. And I figured some stuff out the way. There's still a lot more for me to grow. I'm still a young 30 years old. But uh, some of those pieces, I think, is what I want to, we want to kind of explore today. Mm. How, how much integrity comes along with communication, being aware of your own nervous system, how we, our unconscious intentions might be there. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the hardest parts is coming to terms with, there might be some short-term benefit to us, say, subtly manipulating a conversation or a relationship, but the long-term, it almost never gives you what you truly want. Mm. It doesn't get you to those real ultimate goals. Mm -hmm. So that's, what I'm really curious about, how mm. do we as a collective build communities where we can do that? It's, it's, it's normalized. It's celebrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that phrase. I've never heard this phrase before. Relational neurobiology. Can you dive into that a little bit? Like I have a sense of what you're talking about. Cause I know that obviously relates to the nervous system and the way, cause we're, biological beings we're animals in essence but we're also souls and so there's all of these layers that are happening in communication a lot of what is often un unconscious right so yeah explain a little bit what relational neurobiology refers to yeah i think the original term i heard is interpersonal neurobiology yeah it's like the classic term that dan siegel and peter levine and mm -hmm. these grandfathers, so to speak, or people who've really mastered or been in that body of work for a long period of time. Yeah. And to me, it's a lot of things like polyvagal theory, attachment mm -hmm. theory, these kinds of aspects, like how do you learn, understand your nervous system and your brain and its correlation to relationships and how mm -hmm. people interact. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I understand it. Okay. So within that, like, let's just dive into the nervous system. Cause this is where, when I came along to your workshop, like I kind of stumbled in, right. Didn't know what I was coming in for. And I was fascinated. The timing just seemed so beautiful because you introduced me to a way of looking at the nervous system that I hadn't seen before that seemed directly applicable to some of the challenges that my community back in New Zealand are going through right now. Um, 
so yeah this nervous system model that you use can you explain to us like what it is and how you came to it as well because i've never heard any, anyone else use it yeah. originally i learned it from sarah Payton. she mm -hmm. kind of introduced she did she, she's really good at taking a lot of the evolutionary components of relational neurobiology as a larger body of work and then synthesizing them teaching them and mm -hmm. I think I've kind of done that in a similar way. I've taken a lot from her. I've thought about it in my own ways. And I've even tried to make it even more simple. So I think mm -hmm. most people are, they don't have a very high threshold for super intellectual brain yeah. talk. Yeah, people just want to know what's in it for me and make it and make sense. how does it apply? For, yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. So that's kind of what I've done a bit. And so when it comes to the nervous system, you know, I think it was Peter, you know, Dan Siegel, coined the term window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. And that's when the certain part of your nervous system, when you're in social engagement, you know, you're grounded, you're curious, you're calm. You can read micro expressions in other people's faces. There's a lot in that category. Mm -hmm. And then there's hyper arousal, commonly known as fight or flight, mm -hmm. right? Our heart rate goes up, people's dilate, our hearing changes, our entire body body physiologically prepares to literally run or fight to survive. And then there's the hypo arousal, which is uh, more that shut down, slowing down of the heart rate, commonly associated with things like shame, a shut down, numb uh, dissociation. Mm -hmm. So it would freeze be in the hypo arousal? Yeah. So this is where it gets a little oh, tricky. Oh. Will and this is where it starts to get complex. So the yeah. most common ones is fight, flight, faint are probably the most obvious. Mm -hmm. Freeze is an interesting. I've heard it as it's the line. It's the line because it is. It can be initially a bit of an activating, so hyper arousal because you go mm -hmm. into like a stun, but uh... then usually from that moment, freeze. It can either go into full blown fight or flight, or it can actually go down into shut down. Uh huh. Faint. So I always refer back, like when I'm feeling into this model, like I think of being a wild animal and getting attacked by a lion as such. And it's like, you're not going to fight the lion. You might run if you're a gazelle, because you might have a chance, or you might just, you know, go into the freeze. Um, and I can see, like, when I literally I feel into my, my, with my body, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can feel how that's kind of a hypo to start with and then could go into a hypo yeah okay so keep yes. going yeah because no i'm so, aware that some people are really familiar with this and some people are not so i'm gonna keep like yeah yeah i appreciate that and i really want to just say i'm speaking from this from a lot of humility myself i've definitely studied it and thought about it and had so many conversations about it but no by no yeah. means am i like a literal accredited expert in the area at the same time yeah but what I what happened in the past maybe 10 years or so, it seems that we started to become more aware of the nuances within that those three parts of our nervous system. Mm -hmm. And fawn was a new term that started to become yeah. popularized. Oh my God, that was a revelation for me. I was like, oh my mm -hmm. God, that's the thing. That's what I've been, and then I could track back and I could see it and I it just made my life make so much sense. Um, yeah. So yeah, what's your take so, on fawn? Like, is that hyper or is it hypo or is it like? Yeah. So the the, the reason why fawn, commonly known as people pleasing, mm. is you're mostly in social engagement. Mm -hmm. So on the surface, you come across as, you know, you're you're operating well. You seem fine. And the tricky thing, even more than that, is to yourself, you feel yeah. like you're normal. Yeah. You pretty that was much seem thing. like you're doing. I didn't but, even but, realize. It's like, I didn't know I was doing that. And then once I knew it, I could track it and see it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going into fawn right now. Yeah. Right. So fawning seems to be a little bit of fear. I'd like to see it as kind of like an undertone. So there's a bit of a fear response, right? We're afraid of person judging us, not liking us losing connection etc judgment mm -hmm. and so that can influence how we behave so we're mm -hmm. using all of our social engagement skills 
but the undertone of we're in a little bit of flight. Mm -hmm. So it can really oh. affect how we communicate, how we overcommit to things that we don't want to commit to, yeah. you know, out of the somewhat fear response. Yeah. Like when I feel into it as well, it's like, I'm leaving my own center. It's not, and I'm doing what the other person wants in order to stay safe. Because it's like, if I go along with them, then I'm least likely to be harmed in a more major way. Yes. And like evolutionarily, it, there's, there can be some sense made that we evolved the ability to fawn to kind of get out of dangerous situations or mm. get away from dangerous people or mm -hmm. situations. Yeah. And so it's understandable that we have the capacity to do that. Yeah. Um, but what's not so great about it is that it can happen and we could be doing it a lot, like up to yeah. like almost all the time when we're around other human beings. And what I found is that because you're leaving social engagement, it has a very draining effect uh, and it can cause you burnout. Uh -huh. And then what do we do? We, we could drink caffeine. We could take pills to like, to push that away but we're not paying attention to the body. We're not solving the fawning at its core, which is in the fear response. Yeah. And then you keep pushing, you keep pushing, and then your body starts to have more severe reactions over time, right? Mm -hmm. Chronic di pain, diseases, things like this start to form. Okay. Which I've experienced very much in my life. Burnout yeah. has been a pretty consistent cycle for me. Yeah, just listening to you now, I'm like tracking, because I used to have chronic back pain, and now I'm like, going, oh, was that an aspect of going into it? Because I mean, I feel into when it really flared up, like, oh my God, that was probably an aspect of doing a lot of fawning. Huh. Yeah, maybe we can just think of a couple examples of fawning so to give people a sense of, if that case they don't have a grasp of that. Yeah. One that comes to my mind is I had a habit of like promising people the world like promising them more than there was actually possible like I would, I would message and be like i'll be there in 10 minutes like i'm driving somewhere and i can i clearly if i took a moment stopped realistically checked in it's going to take me 30 minutes but it's almost like this short-term alleviation from my fear um mm -hmm. so that was a common thing that i did it was like a little lying little lies mm -hmm. that i would say all the time Mm hmm that was a common fond response for me hmm. yeah or committing to things saying yes to things getting in the middle of conflict man did i do that a lot uh, like mediating mediating can be definitely a fond response huh i'm afraid that the people can't like they can't work through it and that by by maybe a secondary effect it's gonna hit me and so i would just jump into it because I knew I had some really good skills to help mediate conflict, right. but I would stretch myself way too far. Uh -huh. So it's more of a form response than a skillful response to the actual situation. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of what the conflict's going to cause. Uh, I'm just tracking. <laughs> I mean, I know for me as a woman in terms of form response, I've definitely in the past, like in my twenties with men where I felt like the situation was all dangerous. I've, gone along with it mm. because it felt safer to do that and often i felt as if i wanted to go along with it because i was deluding myself as well and then it's only later that i was mm. like oh shit i was just taking the root of what apparent safety yeah rather than a genuine yes it was like oh it was not a yes that was a fawn mm -hmm. yeah yeah i'm trying to think like acknowledge that there is probably some benefit to have the capacity. Like it, it can yeah. make, keep you safe in yeah. some scenarios. But I think that all of those things, like a nervous system response, like a fear response, like whether you're, you're fighting or you're, it's, it's useful. I think the thing is, is when it becomes a default pattern, when it gets locked on default, where it's just the way that you're interacting with the environment all the time, that's when it becomes problematic mm -hmm. as such. Uh, when there's not an awareness or when there isn't actually a genuine threat 
but the system is still experiencing reality as a fearful thing and so still going into a fear response yeah mm -hmm. definitely uh, yeah that All can right. wreak havoc on your body over time well that's the other thing i'm thinking is that if you're constantly in that fear response like the cortisol levels and the adrenaline levels and all of the stuff that's happening in the body i imagine for some people they don't even realize that they are constantly in that hyper aroused or 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 then going into the hyper arousal and it's a cycle of just like full on and then and there isn't there isn't never any of that just ease where the system is in you know rest and digest as such yes i think the more i learn about the nervous system the more i realize that subtle shifting is hard to do <laughs> Mm -hmm. The easiest thing is big shifts like, oh, I can tell I'm fully in fight or flight. I'm fully dissociated and shut down. But being able to have almost like range within your window of tolerance, like mm -hmm. I can get a little bit into my fight or flight, but I still have the ability to have the skills and the tools to communicate, I have the self-connection and I can kind of navigate it and I can keep it in control, if that makes sense. Yeah. And maybe even regulate myself if I need to. Yeah. And inversely, I find that instead of going to full shutdown, I'm able to experience what I call healthy humility. And I can actually, uh -huh. it is a little bit of like a softening and a little bit of like, hey, you know, maybe I don't fully know what's going on here. Oh, you know, maybe I made a mistake. Mm. You know, maybe I could have done something differently and mm -hmm. not going fully into self judgment, shame response. You know, that's really and that interesting. Range, yeah. That yeah. subtlety, it takes time in my experience. Okay. I'm, I'm going to bookmark that so we can come back to it. But before that, so after Fawn, what's the next one that you have started to explore? This is the one that made me sit up and go, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> so after I heard Fawn and I sat with it for so long and tried to figure it out, the same concept kind of dawned on me one day. I honestly think I was watching an episode of Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> and I always imagine myself being it. And if you don't know the show, a lot of the times it's a game of deception. You have to bold, mm. false lie, make alliances, go behind other people's back. They call it blindsiding each other and vote other people out. And I really just started thinking about it. And I was like, man, that seems like a different part of the nervous system that's not named yet. It's mm. not full blown fight, right? On the surface, you're trying to show that you're in social engagement, you're mm -hmm. calm, you're normal, but there's an intention underneath to like deceive, you know, or win. And I realized, so I, I started being like, hmm, I want to come with a new word that starts with the letter F. And so I thought of the term fraud. Mm -hmm. Like you're kind of a fraud in a sense. Um, and I really started to think about it, think about it how many ways that shows up how many times have i done that in my life and i really see it as a subtle form of protecting yourself a lot of the times mm -hmm. sometimes it can be in fun right survival is a sense where it's meant to be fun and it's a game if mm -hmm. anyone's played the game werewolf there's games out there where they're designed to lie to each other and it can be fun it can be yeah but I think where it gets a lot more tricky is when you're trying not to be seen as weak. You don't want you, 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 do, you have a lower capacity to feel the vulnerability and the humility. Mm. And so we start to go into a slight, like you're mostly in social engagement, but you're a little bit in fight and you're, you're using all of your, cause you, when you're, when your window of tolerance, you still have your prefrontal cortexes are still online. Mm -hmm. Like when you go into full fight or flight, you just yeah. start yelling and calling people's names. Like you're very, you don't have all the skills that you know at, at hand. Mm -hmm. That's the key difference with fraud is that you still have a lot of your capacities mm -hmm. and you can use those. You could use all the techniques and the communication skills you've learned. 
you know, I teach nonviolent communication and you can use any tool to manipulate someone to show that, oh, actually this is your fault. Oh, really? You're just overreacting, right? This mm. is commonly known as gaslighting. So I think gaslighting is a form of fraud. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's the key is that underneath it is a protecting of something vulnerable inside of you. Yeah. You're maybe not willing to face, you're not willing to go into. And to be fair, some people may have grown up where every time they were vulnerable, they were made fun of, they were bullied, they were punished. So it's going to be harder for them to maybe reprogram that, hey, you know what, it is safe. It's okay for me to, you know, find situations, create contexts where you intentionally go into that vulnerability and start to build your muscle, mm. you know, re rewire parts of your brain. Mm. And I see this really strong correlation, oddly, between people who tend to fraud more often, which I think allows them to climb ladders that, that tends to allow them to be in higher positions of power. Mm -hmm. So people in positions of power have a tendency to be a less capacity to be vulnerable, uh, empathetic sometimes humble humble humility yeah, yeah which is a really weird because you're getting rewarded the western world we live in tends to reward you for confidence and maybe a little bit of manipulation to win debate there's a lot mm. of financial and status based reward from that that type of strategy mm. but I think we lose sight of the detriment that it has on our lives, on our society. Yeah. Et cetera. Yeah. When you say fraud, I actually, I immediately think of Donald Trump in terms of he goes into this real bluster and he's obviously like, yeah, but I, I'm like looking at him, I'm like, oh, the little boy, and you know, like he's just, he's so scared of being a loser. He's so scared underneath it all. And that, and that's why I start to reframe it. I'm like, this isn't a guy that's necessarily bad or evil. He's he's simply stuck in nervous system responses mm. that are just on high, you know, because he's desperately defending and protecting the most vulnerable part of himself because he has no idea how to how to feel it, how to how to touch it, how to go into it. Um, yeah, I've seen some some video of this guy tried to count all the lies he says and they tried to make they tried to create how many lies per day donald trump averages it's like 30 or something like that yeah but it, the interesting thing is he comes from the business world and in that world it it it's it's an effective strategy in the sense that you can make money and you can win deals and you know that's where it has some level of success mm. But if we move so into he's, like he's carrying that habit into yeah. how he's showing up as a president. Yeah. But if we move into like I'm part of, I guess you could call it the conscious festival community in New Zealand. And so from that perspective, ideally we're all doing work or self-reflective or working on our communication skills or you know, learning how to listen and respond and take on feedback and be accountable, etc. But something that I have observed with certain, you know, leaders in our community sometimes when they're held to account, I observe that in some ways they appear to be saying the right words, but I'm like, they're not actually like, I'm like, mm. what's going on here? And when you speak about um, coming back to the humility and the humbleness, what it makes me wonder is if there's a connection between someone's ability to, to be genuinely actually humble and the relationship between that and shame in particular and also in fraud like if there's shame in the way would that kind of propel someone into fraud rather than being able to be genuinely self-reflective or self-aware or humble around something yeah I, my sense is that people in their lifetime when they go into shutdown it really is not a good experience for them. They're not met with care and, and reassurance and stability. And so on a deep like childhood brain level, 
it it means like death or it means really excruciatingly yeah. uncomfortable loneliness and it's yeah. quite commonly unconscious they're not even maybe not even aware that that's how they think about or feel about it and so there's a really strong aversion and so I could see someone going into fawn, saying the words they need to say in the moment. And even so believing they don't what they're saying. The... Yeah, but yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. could, and that's the thing. We're complex beings. There could be their adult self that is genuine, really believes it. And at the same time, there's some other parts underneath, like a young wounded child or a protector, because it's like IFS, internal family systems yeah. kind of languaging. But yeah, all of them, it's like a council, an inner council of all these parts, and they're all kind of chiming in, you mm. know? So then when it comes to building community, right? Because it's something I'm passionate about. And like I say, I'm part of this community in New Zealand, and it's a land-based community now, you know, thanks to the vision and the efforts of you know one of the members of the community and so acknowledge mm. him for that what he's done and that land is now owned by you know a collective and so there's a lot of we're learning it feels like there's a learning how to do this it's like how do we as a community hold each other to account how do we understand what's actually happening in our communication styles and that's what fascinates me the most is like communicating with people i'm like is, is communication even happening right now? Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So and there's and a part of me that can, can understand, like, imagine you have a more fiery type personality and that fire allows you to really get stuff done, you know, take bold risks, create new structures, get land, things like this. That's great. The idea of going down into shutdown and healing wounding for example could be really deterring it's like i think some people they're like oh well it takes me away from my power it takes me from what i'm so good at how i contribute to community my purpose all these things mm. so i think there needs to be a really strong restructuring and and communal acceptance that you will become a greater version of yourself. Your ability to even be in your fire and take action is going to dramatically improve. You got to also rec recognize your fire is probably burning people around you. It's probably. Mm. Mm. And it's impacting people's lives. And yes, there's probably a net benefit. You're doing a lot greater things that are doing great stuff. But like being, having accountability system around you where there's a structure in place where you're regularly, especially if you're in a position of power. I think like the, I don't, we don't want to say it, but the famous Spider-Man quote with great power comes great responsibility. It's so yeah. true that yeah. quote will echo in time for forever. But what does that actually mean? Yeah. What does, what does look it like? look like? <laughs> and the difference mm -hmm. between calling someone to account, for example, and can canceling some someone because what mm. I notice is sometimes people feel as if they're being canceled when someone else is just trying to call them to account, yeah. you know, and it's, it is such challenging territory. And then what I also notice, you know, cause we've had some stuff going in our community in the last few months, then other people chime in with this whole idea of like, Oh, it's too hard to do community and no one's ever done it successfully. And they always fall apart. And I'm just like, we're learning. Mm -hmm. We're learning together. We're growing together. Like, let's figure it out together. Can we just stay in love with each other whilst we navigate this? Yeah, and I'll be the first to admit I fall in that camp, the second one you said. I don't tend to get fiery and, like, call things out and try to be more on the fight or flight canceling side. I tend to pull away and be like, I'm going to protect myself by just being alone <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> i i've gone through yeah. kind of cycles of losing faith that communities can be built and be sustainable and then i've learned about new things i've caused healing i've been a part of other communities my hope and my goes up it goes up and then i like go for it again and then usually failure happens and things happen in that and sometimes the natural ups and downs 
Um, but yes, I think what you were speaking to about cancel culture is really important. I do think we need to bring more awareness about how just incredibly ineffective that approach is. I really fundamentally think that the attempt to cancel someone usually creates more of the very thing you're trying to cancel. Mm. It's kind of like if you like hit a dog that's mean, that dog's just going to get meaner. Yeah. If you try, oh, what's the great quote by a, a high, he's a, he's a, he's a king from Lord of the Rings. He says, sometimes the same wind that seeks to blow out a fire may also cause its growth. Mm. Mm. And I really, really think there's deep wisdom in that and this correlation to getting in your, we need to like, this person's horrible. We need to cut them out of everything. Yes. And don't get me wrong. Is there scenarios where some people are dangerous and they need to physically be removed and put into an institution? Absolutely. There is cases where that's very true. Ideally, that institution is focused on healing. Yeah, loving um, and caring and yeah, prison and, and awareness. And <laughs> but what you were speaking to earlier was the complication of then is everything is cancel culture? Well, no. There's such thing as holding you accountability yeah. and really asking you to be able to be in that humility, look at areas where you could improve, understand and fully take ownership for the emotional impact you have on others. Mm. Right? Not take responsibility for how they feel, but care. Just be yeah. like, okay, I hear that that's how that landed on you. You know, and that internal capacity to be able to be face to face with that and not go into fight or flight, go into fraud to actually stay with is mm. really, really important. Yeah. It might be the like tipping point of whether a community can truly work through things together or not. Mm. The ability to be with each other's challenging emotions in mm -hmm. essence. Yeah. Yeah. And, Sometimes we need to call the pause. We need to separate for a while. Yeah. But ideally, we can come back when our nervous systems are a bit more calm. We've got some external support, and we're able to still move through it. Mm. So coming back to humility, I'd love to talk a bit more about humbleness, humility, what your understanding is of it, um, what you've learned about it through your life's journey because i think in terms of leadership when i think of heart-centered embodied leadership it feels like cultivating humbleness it's a necessity mm -hmm. yeah it's like a fail safe in some ways it's like okay if i can remember to be humble less likely to fuck up less likely to be arrogant or you know yeah, asking for a friend <laughs> it's so tricky because the western world we live in yeah, the values that they prioritize, in my opinion, tend to be confidence. Confidence is one of the most, and it's it's not like it's a bad thing. Confidence is a phenomenal thing to strive towards and develop in your life, but confidence without its reciprocal humility, if you take if you're incapable of being humble, and you're just really confident to keep building confidence, it's going to become out of balance. And it's going to turn into arrogance and cockiness and such. And the tricky thing is we live in a world where you can really rise the ladder with that. You get mm. a lot of benefit to that. There's also a lot of detriment. Um, and I think people can sometimes go their whole lives and never really understand why their relationships aren't working and why they just tried to make more money to fill it, a hole they'll never fill. Mm. But that humility piece, it's not something I actually witnessed until I moved home and I went to an indigenous culture, right? The Okanagan Silk people. And I think in their value systems, humility is so much more in balance with confidence. Yeah. They're both really, really important. 
and watching elders and talk about humility at the end, the importance of it and kind of watching it demonstrated. I was like, Whoa, that's so weird. It felt really awkward at first. Mm. I thought it was almost like weakness. Like my closest association to humility was you're being weak. Um, but it, it actually, in my opinion, is a incredible, incredibly important ingredient capacity in the human being to be able to grow to be yeah. able to take ownership i'm trying to think of an example like i've had many instances in my life where and it's a skill i teach now how can you take one percent even how can you take accountability even if it's one percent of the mm. situation it's so easy to get caught up in kind of a blame state. Mm -hmm. This is mostly your fault. Um, and it could be, it could be 95% of the accountabilities on them. But I found that if I'm able to initiate and name my 5%, it shifts the nature of the conversation. I'm role modeling how I want to be, how I want to be in relationship. Mm. And that's really shifted. But the only way I'm able to do that is if I'm able to be in humility. Mm -hmm. You, I don't think, I think they're synonymous. I don't know if you can take accountability truly, like sincere accountability. Yeah. If you're not in a state of humility. Okay. So I like this because we sort of, it's, it's quite logical to me. Like, okay, for accountability to happen, humility has got to happen. So then what I'm curious about is where does shame come in? from the perspective of if there's a lot of shame in the system, is it possible to be humble or is it impossible to be humble if there's still a lot of shame present? It seems like it. It seems like if you have a lot of unprocessed shame and you're using coping mechanisms, like even confidence, I did that as a young man. I like overly did, like I had a self perception that I was way greater than I truly was all as an attempt to not have to feel the shame and the insecurity underneath it. Mm. And I've seen men, I think do that for their whole lives. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of other people do it, but I, I know men, personal men that, that held on to that their whole yeah. life. Understandably, like to some degree, I get it. That's how they're surviving. Yeah. And it's like a tragedy. <laughs> because they're never really able to soften into the shame, be held in it and truly heal this idea that they're fundamentally bad, wrong, not enough. Yeah. yeah. Cause it's not true. Yeah, of course. Right. But it feels like it's so true. So it, what shifted it for you? How come you were able to, was there a particular turning point or how did you go from where you were? Yeah. It's a great question. I think my first step was intellectualizing relational neurobiology. Mm -hmm. So I had to fully intellectualize it. I thought it was fascinating. Then from intellectualization, it gave me the justification to be like, huh, maybe I should learn how to name emotions. Maybe uh -huh. there's some legitimacy to this. Uh -huh. If if my emotional world is simply a compass, it's a feedback mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And it, it, my body's the car so to speak, being yeah. able to read all the lights on the dash and understand what they mean has value, hmm. right? So that once I can interpret that, okay, I mean, an obvious one, rumbling in my stomach, I'm feeling hungry means I need to eat food. Yeah, Most human beings have that, but their capability to notice what their fear is connected to, their anxiety is connected to, their depression is connected to, all the range of emotion. So I think that literacy and self-connection and understanding was the second phase that I went through. And by virtue of that, I went through a lot of shame. I started to, a lot of moments from a little boy, younger versions of me started to come to the surface. Lots of shame there. So you're and in an embodiment shame. phase now? So you went from an intellectualization to being able to read the signs to actually being able to embody or feel what was there yeah and it was gradual yeah i was over at least a couple of years like i probably processed really small surface level things at first like being mad from being in a caught in a traffic jam 
and you know it slowly went deeper yeah what but was the I motivation think... like why why did why go there right because yeah. so like i watch me and i see you know men i love dearly and they know that they've got a lot of shame and they still don't mm. take any action they just find ways to cope deal of you know i'm like Let's just go in <laughs> that's a great question i like i've tried to help a lot of people through that journey as well and i noticed that there can be a lot of complications i know one person stands out and as he tried to go into the emotion it really was debilitating for him and it's mm. almost like he couldn't even live his life it was so debilitating so it was kind of like opening pandora's box yeah. i do think that maybe he has a personality type where he just jumps in fully whereas my personality type is like i take one little step one little step at a time you know i'm like a turtle yeah and so i scaffolded my own emotional intensity not even thinking about it that's just kind of how uh... i approach life Okay, so what I'm picking up from this, yeah, if you, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, if you if you're the kind of person that goes the intensity, it may actually make it really difficult to go in and do the thing unless unless life yeah. forces you. In essence, like, huh, yeah, okay. I'm. I mean, I'm hoping that you, the listener and viewer, is finding this as fascinating as I am. But I I get so intrigued by people that are in communities that do a lot of work and can talk a good talk, but they're not actually doing the thing, you know? And so this is helping me understand the barriers or the reasons why they might not, it's, I don't think it's necessarily even a willingness. I think it's a capability or a capacity um, to be able to go in and do the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm also a strong advocator for treating vulnerability work or trauma work as yeah. kind of a bit of a cyclical process. Like, I do think vulnerability fatigue exists. I've done it. I've gone to like seven day retreats. And by the third day, I'm like, I don't want to do another process. I'm done. Like, I need just to go walk in the forest for the whole day and just not think. So I do think there needs to be spaciousness and time where we're just, we don't go into every little nuance. I was once in a relationship with a girl who had a master's in counseling and we were just so it was so new to both of us and we would just like literally dissect every single micro body <laughs> sensation we experienced yeah and our entire life was our entire relationship was in one giant process and yeah. we overdid it yeah it is tiring <laughs> and it kind of taught me that relationship taught me there's times where i need to kind of i call it emotional containment mm -hmm. emotional containment is also a really valuable skill in my experience, a lot of men, but a lot of people only learn how to emotionally contain. And that's the predominant strategy for having emotional stability in their life. They're relying ah. on a day in, day out. It's still a great skill. Yeah, I and love I, I love I, acknowledging I, that. It's like, this is a great skill. You do that really well and awesome. And now mm -hmm. tiptoe into this as well. <laughs> yeah. And to be fair, I've met people who are on the other side of the spectrum. Yeah. So they'll have great emotional expression. Like they will express their emotions. They're able to process them, mm -hmm. but their ability to contain is really low, mm. which is also important. Yeah. The, a clear sign of this is when someone can't watch like a basic action movie. <laughs> so you could, you could say containment is almost if, if a dissociation is on a spectrum, mm -hmm. the first level of dissociation is probably intellectualizing. Then it goes into maybe somewhat of a a little bit of a numbness sort of and then just full-blown numb and so when i'm watching a movie especially if it's a really intense movie it's almost like my thing my uh level of dissociation is 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 adjusting based off what i'm watching mm -hmm. so the scene is like a really soft quiet moment i'm fully empathizing with the character mm -hmm. like i'm imagining as though i'm them Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden gunshots are going off and they go in a car scene. If I fully, fully immerse myself in that moment, it could be moderately tra traumatizing. Mm -hmm. So I naturally have a safety mechanism built into me that starts to dissociate a little bit. And I can kind mm -hmm. of sit back and see it for what it is and mm -hmm. still find it in interesting. Like it maybe rises me in adrenaline a little bit, 
but if I imagined I was literally in the car chase, I'd have a full blown adrenaline dump. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly what you want. So when I see people watch movies and they can't even watch it, it's a clear sign that they're like fully immersing themselves or fully empathizing and they don't have the ability to turn it off or not fully turn it off, but yeah. What's that word? Like, yeah, just a continuum of being able to. Yeah. I love that. What it's making me realize talking about this is that all of these different um, aspects of the nervous system response serve a purpose and they're all useful and mastery is being at choice rather than being on automatic default. And if we're on automatic default, we probably have our favorites that we hang out in. Um, But when we're in mastery, we can literally adjust according to the needs of the conditions or the circumstances. Yeah. Like if I was singing, I'm trying to think of an analogy here. If I was singing, some singers, first they just learn the pentatonic scale, for example, they hit notes. And then really good singers can start hitting semitones. Mm-hmm. the note the half note between and some can hit quarter which is unreal to me but that mm, really nuance. specific yeah. subtlety between two notes takes a lot of practice uh-huh. and i think in our nervous system there's kind of a similar application the the big obvious difference between fight or flight and you know uh shut down maybe is obvious but learning the subtlety between that, between mm. humility, I'm going to say, and shame, mm. it takes a lot of practice. You got to be in it. You got to put yeah. your hours in. Yeah. Uh, let's shift gear for a little while because I want to talk about the path of he- healthy masculinity because it's one of the things that you teach. You've been a facilitator for a long time. I know that you have um, been like lead counselor and run camps where you've had other facilitators that you've supported working with, with teenagers. Um, how do you handle the natural dynamics that can come up as a facilitator with participants? How do you keep yourself safe as a male participant, as a male facilitator? Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah. So (laughs) obviously when you're a man in a position of power, there's going to be certain challenges you get to learn to navigate. And so it, it, it weaves in with some of my healthy masculinity work for sure. I try mm-hmm. to avoid the term toxic masculinity, for example. I do find yeah. it to be a term that if you say it to somebody, they're very likely going to become defensive. Yeah. But I do like the term restrictive masculinity. Uh-huh. And it kind of refers to there's a restrictive idea of what a man is. And if you step outside of it, then you're not a man. So that it's more an accurate way, I think, of capturing and 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 by virtue of living into that, it can have a toxic effect, if you will, if you want to use that as an mm-hmm. analogy on your life and the people around you. But that is very different than your toxic. Yeah, I, I like that. It separates out the behavior from the person, the identity. Yeah. I definitely had a lot of moments through my being in positions of power in different ways where I had to learn. One of the ones that comes to my mind was when I first started learning nonviolent communication, it gives you this power to hold emotional space. And a lot of women don't unnecessarily experience that with men very well and very often. And so I started to have certain type of like appreciation and openness and maybe being seen as a, a viable romantic partner. Like I would be in a... I actually had this uh, personal growth club that I ran for a year, a few years back, and I would teach NBC, nonviolent communication, pretty often in it. And I remember this one time I taught it, and I was dating this really, really aware um, woman at the time. And we were like in the break, in the middle, and she came up to me and she was like, Warren, I think you need to be really careful about when you teach this. And I was like, Mm. what do you mean? She's like, I'm literally watching one of the participants use this immediately. It looks like he's just using it to try to like connect with her sexually. And I was like, "Ah." I didn't really think about that. So a male participant was picking up your technique in order to. Yeah. Yeah. And to be fair, I think 
if I look at my own history, that's played a factor. I'd be lying if that didn't play some level of, especially early on when I first started learning it, that when I started opening those doors, it's pretty easy to see this correlation. Especially if I'm in a feeling in a deficit, if I'm feeling lonely, I'm not getting sexual needs met, I'm not taking responsibility for that. It's like, I can use these skills to try to convince someone. And so that was happening right in front of me. I didn't see it. I didn't notice it. But my girlfriend brought it up to me. And it really kind of sparked this deep thought process of, okay, how can I teach this so that men have become more aware of this? And so I started to preface saying, hey, look, it's really important that when you hold a space of care, it's a very sacred, vulnerable position for the other person to be in. And you don't want someone to feel like that's being taken advantage of or being used as an opportunity to like make sexual advances. Mm. There's a lot of detriment that that can have. Someone might be like, oh, they start tr distrusting men holding space for them, which is yeah. really detrimental. So I started to preface a lot of my things, talk about that more openly and be like, hey, look, I get it. I get why we might do that. We need to sit together as men and talk about why does that even happen? Let's be really honest about it. Let's, let's hold that with care, understanding, and let's figure out a way through it together. It's not just like demonize the person and make them horrible and like mm. fucking go to cancel, right? It's that's not what's going to actually make true change, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's about being able to be with them through the process. That's what I needed and I didn't really get. Mm -hmm. And that's what men need. Well, that's what boys need, but they don't get. And so we grew up to be men and we don't l learn how to use those powers so to speak, the ability to hold emotional space in this example. But it shows up in a lot of ways. Like in, in another context, I was more in a position where I was uh, in my creativity a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like being charismatic. I'm being funny. You know, there's a lot of power that I'm flexing. And I would notice that it would draw female attention. And more opportunities would arise. And a lot of times there was a pretty strong power dynamic at play. I didn't realize this at first. I actually had to have people pull me aside, sit down with me and talk with me about it. And I, and I was resistant at first. I kind of combative and like argumentative, <laughs> but luckily I was able to kind of try to humble myself and be like, mm -hmm. Hey, they're not saying I'm a horrible person. They're trying to say there's a power dynamic you not be aware of. And it might be have a really strong impact on them you don't realize. And the more I thought about that and the more I felt into it, learned about the nervous system and stuff like that, I was like, okay. So I had to be in humility to accept that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so that's a tricky thing. Yeah. I really want there to be safe spaces for men to be able to unpack that with each other. So maybe I'll share one more small example. Yeah, yeah. At these camps I used to lead, I came up with this idea one year where I would hold a small men's group at the end of every day. And I really tried to create a place where people could talk about what they're struggling with. And sometimes I would name, particularly because this is a creative camp too, creative energy and sexual energy can be very mm. close to each other. There's a lot of like, 17 eight there's a few there's always like a few 17 18 year old girls in these camps that are like come from amazing families they're super creative they're like and some of our facilitators i think some of them are like 23 25 years old so the yeah. age gap between them isn't that far and so i tried to create a space where i was like hey it's normal to feel attraction but as men we need to learn how to be in responsibility with that and so I would share stories of times in my life where maybe I failed with it or, or, or how I learned through it. And I think it's those spaces where we take something that's probably going to be in the shadow. If we just keep trying to cancel it, mm. it's going to stay in the shadow. And it's going to come out sideways. People are going to mm -hmm. find ways 
to meet those needs. But if we can actually bring it to the light, so to speak, to the surface, we can talk about it, we can process it, we can figure it out together. And I think that's where real healing happens. Mm. And that's what I noticed. I It always feels like no one could hold me growing up. No one could like handle my cockiness, for example. <laughs> Everyone got triggered by 17-year-old Warren, 15, 17-year-old Warren. Everyone would come down to my level. And I never had someone that could just stand in the face of me, see right past all my arrogance, and just hold space and help mm. me work through it. Mm. I never got that. And I think that's what happens to a lot of us. No one helps us navigate sexual energies. Yeah. You know? And process what that means to us. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what, in a position of leadership and mentorship, we need to create spaces where that can be held more often. Yeah. And then we're not going to see all these men in positions of leadership eventually find out that they've done all this sexual assault abuse stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, man. So... Tragic. I love that you took the initiative on that, that you could see what was going on and you were just like, let's just deal with it. Let's, like you said, let's bring it into light. Let's create a space where men can be honest and and confront it in essence and learn how to be in the face of it. Um, yeah. You know, because one thing that I see is that, yeah, when there's men in positions of power, I'm just going to speak to men because I, I don't think it happens for women and I don't find it happens to me so much. Um, when there's men in positions of power, they're more likely to have women throwing them, like interested in and in making yeah. approaches and being flirtatious and wanting, mm. appearing to want to. And then it's like, who has the responsibility to be like, there's a power dynamic here mm. and you're projecting and I'm just looking, you know, it, dodgy as. Mm. But it's all, I also imagine it's hard to hold that line. You know, like if I had copious amounts of young men throwing themselves at me all the time, the part of me would be like, can't I play? <laughs> yeah. Right? Like. Yeah. It, that's the thing. I think it's important to acknowledge the yeah. two parts there. One is that it can. you. There are integral, responsible ways of, say, I let a work, I let a retreat. And there's a participant in that retreat and there's mutual interest between the two of us. But I do think that's something we don't talk about and we don't like, I think men as leaders, we need to like be together and be in spaces where we could really unpack this and figure this out together mm. and not be jumping and to judgment, things like this. I think there's been a few instances where it gets a little trickier is mm -hmm. is there sincere intention to build a long-term relationship with this person yeah. or is it just merely like fun maybe one-off sexual experience i think both of them can be done in integrity but it needs to be pretty clear communication there probably needs to be a little bit of space from the moment i think a lot of people say this like retreat highs can happen mm. and if you decide to act off that retreat high I don't know, man. It's tricky. Yeah, it's... I think you have to take full responsibility for that. If you regret it afterwards, you have to take responsibility of the part that you played in it. Both people, both sides. It depends mm. on the power dynamic, right? If it's just a, an adult retreat, I'm the facilitator. They're a full-grown adult. The power dynamic may not be the hard. So that's where it's tricky to us. But there's still a power a sense dynamic, of What right? kind of power dynamic is at play? It's yeah, a lot of factors that factor dynamic. into that. Yeah, there was a, there's been a lot in New Zealand go on because um, ISTA, you're familiar with ISTA, right? Mm -hmm. and yeah. Um, yeah, they used to have where their facilitators were allowed to have sexual relations with the participants and, you know, it was mm -hmm. meant to be above board and no power dynamics, etc. But it just blew up because there was such a misunderstanding mm -hmm. of things like form and the nature mm. of the power dynamic. So ISTA's done a lot of soul searching and I know that now they don't allow that kind of thing to happen at the retreats because it just got too problematic because of everything that was going on. Um, yeah. Also, all of the person who's the participant in that context 
all of their wounding connected to power dynamics is going to get projected onto that person. So all of a sudden, all unresolved trauma, like that, you, it's a tr really, really, I, that's why I think if there is a power dynamic at play, it's got to be a really uh, intentional container you built. Because mm. in some way, you might be able to argue you're almost going into like a conscious form of kink in a way. There's a power dynamic at play. Conscious kink being like, yeah, you're playing out maybe like like a shadow based dynamic. Like, I'm trying to give an example. Like, maybe you had a really unhealthy parental figure that was really controlling and domineering towards you. You could replay that out in a really carefully constructed sexual container, and a lot of healing can come from that. I've mm. seen it. I've experienced it, but. Some people don't really, the intention is not healing. They just find it really hot and they just play it out. So that's just regular kick. Yeah, that's different, right? And I think too, when there's a, when there's, as soon as you had to facilitate a participant dynamic, it's just problem, problematic. It's different from two humans deciding, let's set up a container and let's do this conscious kink thing. We can play this out and resolve this particular mm. trauma because there's not necessarily a power dynamic then. It's two people, two humans co creating. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's so the nuances. it's such a, an important topic to navigate and talk about mm. just how much being in a position of power affects a relational dynamic and the responsibilities yeah. that come with it. Yeah. It's Absolutely. complex. It's super complex. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, on this podcast, like one of the things is power, you know, like the four topics are spirituality, sexuality, power and awakening because they all intersect so much. And it's this is a topic that I've discussed with so many different um, interview subjects mm -hmm. over the period of time. And everyone has a slightly different take, which is super interesting. Um, okay, so I wanna talk about um, decolonization here on this land. And because I think particularly in New Zealand, like my audience in New Zealand would be really interested to know a little bit about the process of colonization here because it was it's very different and i and i can feel that and i can sense that compared to being in new zealand which you know maori culture was more homogenous there were dialectical differences but predominantly one language for example and te reo has had a huge resurgence and you know something like 20 percent of the population now um whakapapas to maori ancestry or considers themselves maori um mm. Yeah, which is which is huge. And there's such I, I freaking love New Zealand. Like it just fills me with so much pride. There's such a sense of like, you know, and coming coming here to to this land and just kind of sensing or feeling some of the like Pakeha is the word that we use in New Zealand for um, non Maori. And mm. it's just such a different attitude sometimes. Like some of the sentences I hear, I'm just like I would just, yeah. So I would love to hear from you, from your perspective, how colonization, I know it's a hard thing to kind of sum up, but I know it is a body of work that you work in. How would you say colonization has impacted First Nations, the land here, culture? I know. Can you do yeah, that in like in two sentences? Can, can you do <laughs> that in two sentences? Can you like distill it down for us? <laughs> I would say it's affected them on a like devastatingly large scale. Yeah. And there's an like ridiculous level of resiliency mm. in the in, in the many different indigenous nations here. Turtle Island sometimes it's called. Yeah. In North America. So the kind of angle I come from it from, there's so many parts of decolonization and all those aspects are really important. Um, I do come from it from this nervous system communication lens. Mm. And the way that I've tried to think about, I tried to create a model where there's a minimum judgment in it. So I think a lot of the times when we're trying to bring awareness to another human being, if there's judgmental language in it, it tends to create more walls. 
So me and my dear friend, Pochenix, Heisler woman, we did some indigenous allyship workshops. And in that, we kind of coined this term, the wall of shame. Mm. And it was essentially this drawing we have where there's like on one side, there's information. It's the beginning of like a river. And as information comes in, particularly information that's emotionally evocative, you're here in Canada, we had residential schools where their schools really designed to kill the Indian within the child, so to speak, like completely assimilate them into Western culture. Um, and a lot of physical sexual abuse happened in these schools to a really, really intense degree. So obviously a lot of these kids came out super traumatized and then they'd be forced onto reserves living in poverty having kids and intergenerational trauma happens and 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 fractured culture some really regained culture some didn't as much so i started to think about oh so the wall of shame once information comes in let's say you start learning about residential schools mm. which can be hard to hear if an unconscious threshold gets passed, so you start to feel shame past the threshold that you have inside yourself, you'll revert to some kind of coping mechanism. And usually it's woven into being in fraud or fight or flight or shut down. And so we'd see these in our workshops all the time, mm. especially Paul Koenigs. I so appreciate her boldness. She does not shy away. She goes right for it. She's willing to say the truth very directly. It's powerful and it's very transformative and it can bring up things for people. And so we came to realize as we built this analogy that if you get past that wall of shame, if you can somehow work with that wall, the defenses, the coping mechanisms, ideally where you can get back to is this like river of grief. Mm. and really being able to empathize yeah, and go through your own emotional process, your own shame connected to your ancestry. Mm -hmm. And through that process and maybe even reconnection to your own, your own ancestry, which might've also been colonized. Mm -hmm. Only then seems that we're going to be able to start to get to this ocean of possibilities, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The river of grief is the way to that. And that's a lot of heart connection, heart understanding. Yeah. But we live in a structure where I have this one diagram where on one side, it's the values that the Western world tends to prioritize. Mm -hmm. So things like productivity, independence, emotional containment, mind-based intelligence, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And on the left, uh, on the right side, on the other column, it looks at, I wouldn't say it's the values that indigenous people prioritize, but they have a bit better, better balance between the two. So on the left side, instead of productivity, other side could be self-care. So how I've looked at what colonization is in a really sim simple way is a certain number of values that are being overly prioritized to the point that it's become out of balance and it's having a bunch of impacts. Yeah. So for example, the easiest one to unpack is productivity. If you overly focus on productivity in your life, what effect does it have? Right. Pretty much anybody can answer that question. I think I could ask a CEO of a major company. I could ask them and they clearly answer it. Right. I'm not saying you're horrible. I'm not saying you're, you're a monster CEO's raping the land but i'm like hey let's think about productivity for a sec when we overly focus on it what happens to you as an individual mm. they're going to be able to name okay so how can we bring in a little bit more self-care maybe it's 10 percent more to restore a little bit of balance to that out of balance system priority and i think the process of decolonization is a lot of this happening on a systemic scale. Yeah. Is being able to take some of these other really important values that we've neglected and bringing them into balance. But it mm -hmm. means fundamentally restructuring 
a lot yeah. of things in our society. Yeah. Which I think first probably needs to happen on an individual level, like just the way I build my day to day life. Mm -hmm. When I take when I teach this, I find that that's how people typically apply it, understandably. And it's been hard to actually integrate it on a structural level. Like when I work with an organization, I'm like, okay, so let's take this concept of productivity, self care. How do we weave that into your weekly meeting? <laughs> what What do we do? What, what What would we say the percentage is right now? How much productivity, how much self care do we have in your weekly meeting? And it's like 100 percent, 99 percent. Okay, what would it look like to buy more percent to self care? Let's brainstorm our ideas of how we could do that. You know, and there's some really not just the productivity one, but I've had some really cool ideas come from that process. One time I was working with this uh, group and they said that their meetings were two things, dry and boring. Everyone was like on their devices, completely disconnected, all just left brain information yeah. the whole time. And two, it was uh, people felt fear of speaking up asking mm. questions, challenging things, there was a fear. And so that also caused the closed offness. So we came up with two ideas. One is we took a lot of the information they were sharing and we streamlined it to being online. Because so a lot of what they're saying in the meetings, they didn't have to do in person. Yeah, It could be done in a different platform. Yeah. So we found like we opened up 20 minutes of time and we took 20 minutes that time and I taught them like two or three connection-based exercises. They can get to know each other on a personal level. They can have a little bit of fun. And then the secondary thing we came up with was an object of immunity. <laughs> and they put uh... it in the center of the table. And what would happen is if they wanted to say something, they wanted to ask a question, whoever was holding that object, everyone really did their best to like give them the benefit of the doubt, knew that they were coming from ignorance, innocence in a way. And really with the intention to like, let's maybe ask the uncomfortable question or let's unpack things that it may be hard to talk about, you know? So that was two mm. things that we came up with. Yeah. Um, as an example of trying to shift away from maybe certain value systems that are yeah. really championed in the Western world and bring in a couple other ones to restore a bit of balance. Yeah. I like that. I'm also curious. I wonder how long they keep the new structure after you guys leave yeah. the building. <laughs> That's true. Because it needs a champion, right? It needs someone to it's hold true. you. Um, but I love that approach because when I feel into, you know, decolonization, what I see is that it's we're talking worldviews. We're talking ways of relating to reality in essence. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I look at all the challenges that we're facing globally, my sense is that we really need to shift worldviews to a more indigenous worldview in order to actually thrive as a species, you know, for humanity and, and all the other beings to thrive. It just seems so obvious. Um, and what I also see is that, you know, I've had an experience of going into a workplace and it's the first time that I've been immersed in what I would call the capital, you know, that whole way of being. And I'm just, it's so alien to me. Like we would go into a meeting and I want to pause. I want us to all take a few breaths together. I want our nervous systems to connect and I want us to share what's on top and deal with our emotional stuff before we even dive in. And I'm just going, this makes sense, you know, being in circle and connecting and operating in this way so that we can be more human with each other mm -hmm. and allow the collective field to lead what's unfolding. Um, so when I feel into decolonization work, it's so much about a recognizing there is a worldview that's influencing everything there. And there are other worldviews that may be even more useful or valuable now that we can step into, you know, mm -hmm. or bring more balance. Right. Yeah. That's how I it, like to see it. It's like, it's restoring balance that's been yeah. lost. It's not about one group of people being horrible. You know, it's like that they themselves got lost and out of balance. Yeah. And unfortunately, they forced that structure on everybody else, mm -hmm. which is not ideal. That's also a reflection of how lost and like in power they are. Mm. So how do we 
become aware of how we're out of balance? And mm-hmm. then what do we need to bring in to start to bring restore balance? Mm-hmm. That's mm. the way that I look at it through that lens. And I think almost everyone can sit together, get on board with that and be like, okay, yeah. When we're out of balance, how does this affect us? Mm-hmm. It's the negative downsides. Mm-hmm. So what do we have to do? What are the other things we need to bring in? Mm. I can feel the part, I can definitely feel the part of me that's like gets fired up and just wants to go all in and like massive shift and just like, Part, partly because I'm like, we're going to crash and burn. Like, you know, being in Canada is interesting because we can't, we're in the height of summer, right? And there's literally mm. wildfires burning and the heat. I don't remember it being this hot when I was here 20 years ago. For sure yeah. not. And, and I can sense it in the culture. Like, I don't know that it's really, there's something alive in the air here that makes me feel quite disquieted, a sense of like, fuck consumerism is continuing as if it's all okay and it's not all okay like yeah. it's it's not okay like we are not okay i feel a little bit like a canary in the mind in the mind right now going yeah. i can feel it and and it's like it's not business as normal <laughs> you know yeah so. i do think there's been a general trend of complacency or apathy or just like hey you know what i'm just gonna live my own life here and yeah i can barely pay rent like i just need to focus on my stuff i i can understand that Mm. and yet i do think there's a level of urgency there i do think we're capable we're we're ingenious we're Mm -hmm. resilient creatures Mm -hmm. we can find a way Mm -hmm. i just i i guess i worry if we wait till the most ridiculous disasters to come Right. It's like if you don't listen don't to the small bitch slaps that life gives you, they just get bigger yeah. and bigger and fucking bigger. You know, I've learned yeah, that I my own that. life. <laughs> it, you're right. So like there's that quote, um, your body speaks to you in levels. First it mm. speaks to you in a whisper. Mm. If you don't listen, then it pokes you. If you don't listen, then it slaps you in the face. And if you don't listen, then it hits you with a bus. <laughs> and what's interesting <laughs> about that is like in the Okanagan culture, we have a word uh, like snuck seal, which is kind of like, there's so many things. Every word we have has so many layers of complexity in them. But one sentiment I've learned is called sharing one skin. And so mm. like you see the land as an extension of your own body yeah. and each other's bodies. So the same in the same sentiment, we are saying, if you don't listen to that first impact it's gonna keep escalating until you have no choice Mm -hmm. and it seems as though that's the trajectory we're going and it's tough right people are getting into that wall of shame and then they're going into some kind of coping mechanism Mm -hmm. they're finding ways to rationalize their ways out of it right oh global warming's happening if you look at large scales over 10,000s of years this is normal and you can find rational ways to not have to feel the fear of how dangerous things could become um, mm. or feel guilt or shame about destroying the earth and all of its ecosystems so it's like if we don't have the ability to be with the emotion yeah i think we'll just keep finding ways to not have to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. And I think this is where the personal really does come to the collective. Like um, just to kind of begin to tie up all the different things that we've spoken about that as we as individuals or parent individuals learn how to master our nervous system and work with it skillfully, then we have mm. more ability to really meet and hold our emotional landscape which means we can then meet and hold the emotional landscape of the people around us so now we've got nervous system regulation and we've got the ability to digest emotion which means that we can actually deal with trauma and then my sense is that starts to come out into the collective so we can begin to actually address the fundamental root challenges that are facing us as a society um and it feels like it's all interwoven and i feel like the decolonization piece is such a big part of it and i love how you 
really brought it back to balance and, and a sense of partnership like and that makes me go because I do have a tendency to go you know fuck fucking our culture like fuck western culture you know there's a part of me that's just like fuck that shit you know um but what if there was a union what if there was a, a coming together what if there was of of the the beauty of both as such hmm. yeah yeah I sometimes I think it's like the chicken or the egg I've heard a lot of people go back and forth. Do we need to change the system or is the change come from the individual? And I've heard a lot of people. It's both. It, I do. I think, I think it's always going to be it's both. It's always going to be both. Yeah. But it's obviously it's a great sign. If there's enough individual change that those people get into a position where they can start building systems. Uh huh. But that's the irony. There's a little irony in there for me is that the people who seek the power and the positions of power usually are not the most healed. I think that's something that. Well, I'm that's not only sure if how, you're perceiving but... the ones and certain, like, there's other ways to perceive power as well. Like, you're talking about visible power and the sort of the. Yeah, the, it's structural. You know, the structural. Yeah. And, and I'm a little mm. bit curious in terms of there's other ways to build and wield power that don't necessarily have that kind of visibility that could be just as impactful and effective. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it might not be like the executive director of a company, nah. but it could be the position you hold in your community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and mean, when communities start to shift, like I do keep coming back to the sense of the individual shifts and then it creates a cell of community, you know, like, get 12 people together and they're operating in a different way and then they there's 12 people and there's 12 people and there's 12 people and then you have cells coming together and then that's a shift there's other way it's like an interconnected web that can rise up from underneath you know so mm -hmm. i know i mean i could riff on this stuff forever but i'm aware of time and there's two things i'd love to close on here one do you know how to properly pronounce squamish squamish and if you do, can you share it with us? Because I would love to. So yeah, let's, let's do that piece first, and then we'll come to the second yeah. piece. Yeah, I'm a little rusty, probably. I, I won't yeah. be able to do it as uh, a language speaker. Um, I'm gonna kind of blank even on the language. But Skohomish, Skohomish is closer. I'm probably off a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Skohomish. Well, it's a tricky thing is I speak in interior yeah, like, Salish and it's got similar sounds. So sometimes I confuse them. Yeah. Skohomish. Skohomish. Yeah. So you 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 took some time to do the Yeah. Like in my language you go like a jet soaring through the sky helps kind of so, build that but I can sound. feel it like as I start to go more into something that's a little closer I can feel the energetics begin to change and I feel something begin to open up and language is so important the way we pronounce the words changes the energetic resonance you know so just to even explore that and get a little closer and I know there is a YouTube clip on it um so yes uh, yeah there's yeah. Oh my gosh, my brain's just not working right we now. We have been talking for call, a long time. Call, yeah. Call some calls. I'll I'll throw a link yes. down underneath in the yeah. show notes. Okay, final piece. Final piece is I love to close with a prayer or a vision, right? Mm -hmm. And so is there something that you would love to call into beingness when you feel into your community, you will land into this land mass, Turtle Island, Canada. Yeah, is there something you would love to say a prayer for, call into being? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm holding this vision of, you know, communities, organizations, clubs, just where people congregate that we normalize doing things that help emotional regulation whether that's breath work or movement anything singing together mm. those kinds of things more 
woven into our daily lives and it's maybe we're slightly moving away from maximizing profit but we're moving into things that make us feel good and regulate our nervous systems and i'd also love to see it's okay to get triggered it's okay for things to come up and we really normalize spaces where we can go into and hold that process where it comes from with consistency i think those two things mm. just I, I i got the sense that we have we haven't even really seen the world that's possible yet yeah all of us are still so recovering from trauma that yeah. as we move towards that that the possibilities are just could be truly yeah. incredible yeah and feel as you say i'm like oh yeah where it's just normalized to have practices that bring us into emotional nervous system regulation and it's just normal to be able to hold space for each other and to process things and it's not even a big deal it's just like we're just doing the thing yeah i'm i'm like imagining some people thinking you think group singing is gonna calm my nervous system when i teach the songs and workshops people are like terrified yeah but i think once you get chair. past that yeah period, wow <laughs> i was that person i was terrified and it's become one of my favorite things so god bless well right. thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and your presence and coming on and kickstarting this next canadian flavored version of conversations with carolia my pleasure mm. That was Warren Hooley sharing on all things communication related and healthy masculinity, colonization, a lot on the nervous system and emotional regulation. Loved his prayer at the end. Love that. So my reflections on this, I feel like, what do I feel like? I feel tired. I definitely feel tired. It was, a, it was a big conversation and thank you for making it all the way through to here. I think the big thing is please don't give up on community. Do not give up on community. Do not think that or realize that people are always doing the best they can and there are no bad people. Like my sense is that everyone is just playing out their shit. Everyone is playing out their conditioning. Everyone is playing out their trauma and the more that we understand where someone is moving from. So if someone is being challenged or held to account and they're going into fraud and they're spinning more delusion or more lies and they're not really taking responsibility and they're blaming others and they're in that, it's not necessarily like they're consciously choosing to do that, right? It's just what's happening. And then the question from my perspective is, how do we recognize where those community members are and how do we hold them with love and how do we invite them to continue to do that in a work right because we are all on the walker together you know ultimately nobody is outside of that we are ultimately all in community together so to stay in love with each other to keep calling each other in to keep calling each other to account out of love not because we're blaming or making each other wrong or making each other bad or any of that, to really understand what it is to be in a flesh suit, to be an animal, right? To recognize how the nervous system functions, to recognize how emotional regulation functions, to recognize how trauma plays out over time, to recognize the relational dynamics. You know, like one question I'm asking myself is, why do I get so involved in this? Why does it matter so much to me? And, you know, to, to be completely vulnerable and honest, it probably goes back to my family of origin and some of the problematic behaviors that occurred there that I can't address and I can't fix that have led to ruptures that I don't feel like I can repair. So when I see similar but different things happening in my community, I feel like I do have power and influence to maybe write a different story. And in some ways, isn't that what we're all doing is we're trying to write or repair the story of our childhood and live into a different story. So, so grateful for Warren and all the things that he brought. So thankful. I hope you can see the way that he's reflected the journey that he has been on as a man, as a facilitator, as someone who fuck a papa's to um, indigenous folk here in Canada. 
I lo- just I really enjoyed his perspective and what he had to say about humility and humbleness. So much goodness. So welcome back to Conversations with Karalia. We are a go. I will keep interviewing people and exploring these things around spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. <sighs> I love you all. I really do. Like I absolutely love you all. Mm. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Karalia. And trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karaleah.com. That's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com. And subscribe to my weekly newsletter.